optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I ask you a personal question? Now it is in a broken time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. Dozens, maybe even hundreds of you have asked me, what shirts are you wearing on YouTube videos for a very specific set of shirts? And they are from Roan Apparel, R-H-O-N-E. And I'm packing for a trip for seven to 10 days. And I would say half of what I'm going to pack is from Roan. These are the most comfortable shirts, and they have much more than shirts, that I have ever worn, at least for active wear, for getting out and about. And you can even sneak them in to, say, a business casual or a dinner if you want, if you're a Long Island kid like me. They have minimal branding. You don't feel like you are walking around with some type of billboard on your chest. Anti-odor technology, because I am a smelly bastard, and I can somewhat end up smelling like a muskox halfway through the day. They have pure melted-down silver in their fabrics. And I love these shirts. I love their pants. I love their shorts. And I've been wearing them pretty much every day for the last few weeks, at least one item from them. So you should check it out. This stuff is not cheap because it is made from premium materials. And if you want the best, you got to pay for the best. And that's just the way it is. But there's no risk in trying them out. They provide free shipping and a 100-day return policy. That is plenty of time to feel them out. So check it out at roan.com forward slash Tim. That's R-H-O-N-E dot com forward slash Tim. You can get 15% off, which is exclusive for listeners of this podcast. You're welcome. Using the code Tim. You got to use the code, folks. And at that URL, roan.com forward slash Tim, you will also see the shirt that I would suggest maybe starting with. It is the Scout Crew Neck shirt. I like the red. I like the black. I'm wearing the red right now as I record this. And that is all for this sponsor announcement. So check it out, roan.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by Trunk Club. There are two types of men out there. You know who you are. Guys who love shopping for clothes, but are short on time, category A. And those of you who hate it, category B, I am in the latter category. My fashion sense is also probably somewhere between homeless and confused with a dash of lazy added in. Either way, you can take heart. And I've used Trunk Club now and have found some of my favorite pieces of clothing that make me look a lot better than I would be able to handle on my own. And there are many reasons for that. But you can get clothing that fits perfectly and looks amazing without ever stepping into a store again, thanks to Trunk Club. And they make it very, very easy. And the clothing is handpicked by a personal stylist, your own personal stylist. All you have to do is go to trunkclub.com forward slash Tim, type in your measurements, share your likes and dislikes. They'll pick your clothes from more than 80 top brands and ship them right to your door. You keep what you like, you send back what you don't. If you don't like any of it, send it all back. Doesn't matter. And Trunk Club is not a subscription service. This is what appealed to me, among many other things. I didn't want to constantly be getting dinged by things or have to deal with the headache of constantly getting boxes. It's not a subscription service. Shipping is always free, and you have five days to try on the clothes. So, a uh, couple of points here. Number one, get started today. Go to trunkclub.com forward slash Tim. Try it out. You get premium clothes, expert advice, no work, no risk. That is a winning combo, and I have found some of my favorite espadrilles, shoes from them, bright green. Uh, I do like the color green, and they actually work. I've had so many compliments on these shoes, and more people ask me where I got them than any other pair of shoes I've ever had. And uh, more shirts. I kept ended up keeping about, I would say, three quarters of my box, which I did not expect to do. So go to trunkclub.com forward slash Tim and check it out. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job to deconstruct world-class performers to tease out the habits, tools, beliefs, tricks, and so on that you can apply to your own life. And this episode, we have one of your favorites. We have Charles Poliquin back for another round. And in this episode, he is answering your favorite questions, those questions that were upvoted the most by you guys. Charles, you can find him on Twitter and elsewhere, at Strength Sensei. 
and strengthsensei.com, is one of the best known strength coaches in the world. He has trained elite athletes from 20 plus sports, including Olympic gold medalists, NFL all pros, NHL all stars, Stanley Cup champions, IFBB bodybuilding champs. His client list is long. It includes long jump gold medalist Dwight Phillips, NHL MVP Chris Pronger, and MLB batting champion Edgar Martinez, among many others, and the lady who won the first gold in Olympic wrestling for the US. So the list continues to grow. And as we creep towards episode number 200, what? How did that happen? His first appearance on the podcast is still one of the top 15 most listened to episodes. So you should definitely check that out. It is controversial and uh, very, very fun and very, very dense. And he is constantly requested by you guys for a round two. So here you have it. In this episode, uh, we cover a lot. He goes deep on several topics, including his favorite mass building program of all time, recommendations for older lifters, latest thoughts on hormones, insulin, of course, insulin is a subset of hormones, and diet, how to uh, differentiate, oh, can't handle the syllables today, how to differentiate a terrible trainer from a good one and the good from the best of the best, his nighttime routine for improving sleep, oh my God, Goodness gracious, I need more sleep. Why most people screw up abdominal training, ketosis, and muscle gain, and much, much more. So I'm going to go drink more coffee, and I hope you enjoy round two with Charles Poliquin. Hi, welcome to the Tim Ferriss Show. Our first question is from Kevin James. He's asking for recommendations for older lifters, 40 plus, but with a lot of years of experience. He's asking what's the sets, what's the reps, what's best uh, for this. Um, he also points out there's not very much advice for experienced lifters. And he's also wondering, is it all downhill from here? Well, let's look at it this way. All systems in your body, human body will age. Your hair gets gray, your eyesight drops, your hearing drops over the years. So everything drops and your muscle strength and muscle mass will also drop. But what's a acceptable rate of drop? The best way to measure that is actually go look at the World Masters Championships in weightlifting. And what you typically see is that the world record holders in their youth, when they compete in seniors or the Olympic Games or World uh, Senior Championships, whatever they can do, let's say at age 34, they lose about 1% one percentage point per year. So let's say if the guy did 200 kilos at his best at the Olympics in the snatch, 20 years later, he'll do about 160 kilos. And that's how you see the guy has kept on training really hard. So some people advance the fact that it could be 1% per year after the age of 26, but a lot of it has to do with uh, training methodology. So you have to have realistic goals of what's good for your age group. The best place to find that information is actually Brooks Kubik as a book, a series of book called Dinosaur Training Secrets. In volume two, which is called All Strong Are You, which you can find on Amazon, um, he outlines lift specific norms and age specific norms. So let's say you're 60 years old and you want to know what's a good back squat when you're 60, you go there into your age and the lift and you'll be able to see what's good for you. I think having a realistic goals uh, will appease your mind. You're not going to do at 70 what you did when you competed at the Olympics, obviously. Um, so uh, that's what I would do for you. But you, you will, as far as training recommendations, as far as sets and reps, because of declining hormone levels, your ability to recover from workouts is somewhat impaired. If you are on a hormonal replacement therapy and you have testosterone therapy, GH therapy, thyroid therapy, and so on, you will lose some, but not as fast as, uh, as uh, one of your colleagues who's not at their hormones replaced. The next question is from Yasser Nadim. He stipulates, you said that one must be lean enough to earn carbs 10% or less. Uh, how can one test their individual's insulin sensitivity and determine if they are lean enough to make good use of carbs or not. Well, the point is, is that if you're fat, you don't need to do any blood work to find out that you need carbs. So 
for a male, your body fat should be less than 10%. Less than 10% would mean that when you stand up, we can see your abdominals and you can see the linear elbows. Therefore, you could see every row of abs. Most people think that they have abs, they can see one. That's not abs. You could do blood work. The best blood marker to see if you deserve your carbohydrates is actually the HB1EC. You could run that test for $14 to $40. It's always covered by insurance. There's many more sophisticated tests, but this one would be good enough. And you want to have your HB1EC below 4.8. If it is below 4.8, you sure can afford carbohydrates. Now, you may want to eat carbs when you're 26%, but don't complain. You, your body composition is not improving. If I put you on a desert island and all I give you is protein and fats and fiber being, if you want a carb, you're not going to die. There's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. So I think for most people, just sheer laziness that makes them verge on carbs. You, if you don't deserve them and you want to get lean, then you got to stay away until you get lean, but it shouldn't take you that long. Question number three comes from Joe Mulhern. He asks, what's your best routine for mass? I'm confused about the best way to spend time between strength work sets, which feels like it adds up a lot of wasted time. I've, I get this question every day. Tim asked me to talk about it. We've seen it at least 10 times on Tim's uh, Facebook page, about 25 times when people ask me what I, uh, questions in the last time I posted on that. What I've done for the Tim Ferriss listeners is that I've, uh, look back at what I've done in the last 38 years and found the best approach uh, for that. So in this, it's a book, it's an ebook, and I, I'm going over everything with all the types of splits you can do because not everybody can commit the most time to it. I mean, obviously, the fastest way to gain mass is to spend a lot of time on it, but it's only good to a certain point. We have what we call the law of diminishing returns. So I had the tell you which exercise to do, how to eat, what type of supplements. And I've actually filmed every exercise, so there's no guessing. And I've taken pictures. And each exercise is actually filmed from two different angles, so it should be very clear for you uh, to get that. I've never, ever sold my programs like that online. Uh, so I'm going to make it available on my site for two weeks and then take it down. If you're interested, check it out. It includes 12 weeks of routines, how to personalize your workouts, nutrition advice, everything you need. To get the book, go to strengthsensei.com slash mass. So to answer your question, in a nutshell, your muscles will grow faster if you spend usually two to three weeks working on training volume. Usually your reps will be higher than eight up. You could be up as much as 50 for the quadriceps. And then you go two to three weeks on low reps. Because after a while, the amount of weight you can actually use for high reps is what dictates how much muscle mass you're going to gain. So if you're weak for reps, it's going to limit how strong and massive you will get. So from experience, I mean, I've had a lot of the sports where people need to increase muscle mass, whether it's rugby or hockey or American football. And I've found over the last 38 years, that the alternation of volume versus, uh, which we call accumulation phases versus intensification phases is probably the most productive way to gain mass. And if you go to my website, strengthsensei.com, I got all sorts of examples of mass building routines. Next question comes from Feather Bear. And please, I apologize if I don't have the right pronunciation. I only speak three languages, so I don't always know how it's pronounced. He says, in the last podcast, you mentioned Gotcha Cola doing a good job against stretch marks. What dosage do you use? Usually, if it's a good standardized extract, like the one made by Gaia, G-A-I-A, you would take six capsules of 500 milligrams in divided dosage, so two tablets three times a day, and uh, it works wonders. The next question is from Bryce Lee. What injuries did you personally have to do with a career of maximizing swollen trophy? Uh, and how do you deal with them? It seems that no matter how careful we are, we inevitably run into injuries if we pursue our pertrophy and PRs for their own sake as we age. The best way to avoid injury is actually rotation in the exercises. 
my friend Matt Benning was two world records in the squat, has had zero injuries. But if you look at his methodology, he has a lot of variation. He doesn't overuse exercises. So if you go to my website, strengthsensitive.com, I actually talk about overuse injuries. The biggest cause of injury is to stick to favorite exercise ad nauseum. I just did a tour with Matt and Ed Collins a multiple time world champion in powerlifting. He's, he's set over 72 world records. He's had a few injuries compared to Matt. And at lunch, he was discussing that if he were to start his life over, he would have varied his exercise selection more often. Because it's like anything else, if you, if you don't change the pattern overload of the given exercise, your cartilage is always exposed to the same amount of stress. Proper warm-up, I think, is the most essential way to prevent injuries. Avoiding static stretching before lifting prevents injuries. Getting re regular soft tissue work prevents injuries. But one thing that Dr. Robert Rakowski points out is that we live in a more and more polluted um, era. And he finds, and all my lifting coaches, colleagues who are over the age of 50, is people are getting injured more often and more severely than before. And one of the things that uh, Robert Rakowski points out is toxic overload, pesticides, uh, heavy metals, and so on. So if you uh, pay attention to eliminate all sorts of toxins and do things like chelation therapy, you diminish your toxic load, which, which should help you prevent injuries. So there's a biochemistry to it, but there's also the biomechanics of it. The question is from Jason Bartlett. He says, like, YouTube fitness experts, or so-called experts, unrealistic workouts and expectations set by hand hands people, uh, that kind of sets up for unrealistic expectation and goals. He says, how do we combat misinformation? I agree with you. There's a lot of people on the internet that have no place being there, but there's no such thing as a board to look at uh, the quality of what's on YouTube. However, I think what you have to look more to is that as the person add results with themselves and are they good at training other people? So if I want to have an intelligent discussion uh, with uh, strength training experts, I know who to find because they've produced athletes multiple times in a repetitive fashion. Um, so for example, Josh Bryant has very good books on weight training. And the information he publishes actually works. He's the lightest man to ever have bench press 600 pounds. Um, guys like Paul Carter can give you good information at Cone. But to go on the internet for reliable sources of information can be rather confusing. What I think is a shortcut to do that is to take seminars with those guys because there's a lot of stuff you can't put in a book or that, for example, with technique in a squat or the deadlift, you can't learn that through a book or by watching videos. What you think you're doing and what you're actually doing are two different things. So what I would do if I were you, instead of wasting your time on the internet watching stupid stuff that doesn't do anything, uh, I would look at those guys and hire them for consults because uh, you know, there's a saying, if you're too cheap for to pay for information, you'll fall by the wayside. And most of the stuff that is there for free is actually worth nothing because um, a lot of people are trying to make a place under the sun and they'll stay stupid, stupid stuff just to be different, but it doesn't mean um, that's any good. Like Tim says, you know, you could put your underwear over your pants, but is it more, uh, is it better or is it more fun? It's, uh, more fun for people to laugh at you, but it's certainly not more comfortable or better. So different and, and better are not synonyms. And it's better to use someone who's had uh, time tried training methods. Then there's a peer reviewed, peer reviewed uh, crowd who never produced anybody and only wait till it's published in science with 60 papers. I wouldn't trust those guys either because they don't have any clinical experience. It's like basically consulting a virgin sex therapist. The next question is, Marco Cuyacha asks, 
What differentiates between a good personal trainer for a great PT? Where should someone start if they want to become a PT? What are common mistakes PT make? What official certificates should a PT have to start teaching strength? What initial strength courses should an expert PT take? Thank you. Well, your ability to produce results is what distinguishes you in the field. So for example, Nick Mitchell and Ultimate Performance, they have established a brand by producing results. So if you go to any UP around the world, whether it's in Marvia, Spain, or if you're going to Manchester, UK, there's a wall full of uh, success stories. And those success stories are always within about 12 weeks. So the best way to learn, in my opinion, is to offer to do free internship with a well-producing gym, like Shredded in Australia or um, Wolfgate in Prague. So seek out who has constant and good results and offer to intern under them for free because you have no experience. And then they will teach you the system and they will point you to the right books. I mean, your question is would be very long to answer, but official certifications, in my opinion, don't mean much. I've seen people with lots of different certifications and it's still your ability to produce results that makes a difference. And you have to learn how to do a a training system. So if you told me I want to be a great strength coach, I would say go learn with Ben Prentice in Connecticut. He's produced years over years of NHL players, NFL players, uh, Major League Baseball players, because you can't acquire the stuff just in classes and just by books. You have to get somewhat, what I would say, in the trenches. And those guys that I strongly recommended are people who spent a fortune in education and they will actually save you time. So if you go intern, let's say, a month for free at a UP, provided they accept you because they'll ask you to see you know, some colors before you show up, you would learn far more than taking thousands of hours of um, certification courses. In the near future, I will produce uh, videos for IDEA, which is the largest certification company in the world. And those will be good to get your theory down. But if you listen to those videos, you'll have a good idea of what reps you should do sets so that you're prepared once you go into the field to maximize your results. But what makes a great PT versus a good PT is simply the ability to produce results. But you need to learn the systems from a world-class mentor. The next comes from, question comes from Daniel Matthews Kazimirchuk, typical Irish name. Um, which supplements do you currently use for improving sleep? Personally, I'm a big fan of magnesium threonate. I take six capsules at bedtime mixed with two grams of theanine, T-H-A-N-I-N-E. I will post a page to where to get these uh, ingredients on the website. The next question comes from Marcus Beamer. There are many things you might regret, but what's the thing that comes to mind most often? Well, what would I change if I could do it again? I, I wish the four-hour week would have been published when I started my career. People tell me often, you are very lucky. I got very lucky by working 20 hours a day for years on end. So when you work that many hours, and that doesn't include the training. So for years, for about eight months out of the year, I would only sleep three hours a night. I would say that's my biggest mistake. I said yes too often, and I should have been concerned more with the quality of the athletes I trained. The problem was is that when I would get hired, I would get the whole national team. Once I established credibility of being consistent with results, when I would negotiate with national team, I would tell the national team, these are the guys I'll pick. These are the guys I will train. So it would have saved me time on writing programs, administrating programs, monitoring programs, teaching technique. But you need to have a reputation before. So I, I spent a lot of time doing that. What I've learned over the last few years is that you get known by the jobs you turn down, not the jobs you accept. A few months ago, Ellen Maroulis won the gold in Olympic wrestling for women. First time that America did so 
for weeks I've been asked to do seminars, write books, take on more national team athletes, train foreign teams. And I said no to all one of these requests. Why? Because I'm really geared up. I don't do the four hour work week, but I like to do the four and a half hour work day. And, you know, one thing I do regularly is I take a week off a month to rest, to read, and I take three months vacation a year. Probably having a child was probably the best thing for me to learn how to prioritize things. So I really started to cut back on the amount of work uh, once I had my daughter. But the biggest mistake I've ever done was to work far too much. Now you got guys like Gary Vaynerchuk will say you need to hustle. You do, but you should still favor quality over quantity. And if you want to understand the concept better, I strongly suggest you read the one thing and to read the four hour work week. It's just a mental outlook to what you do. The next question is from Jonathan Anderson. Thanks to Charles, I'm now big into omega threes to keep my autoimmune remission. Dr. Barry Sears says three to one EPA to DHA. I'm taking that ratio out at a greater expense. Is it worth it? Should everyone go on it? Well, Dr. Guignot, unfortunately passed away a few years ago, was probably one of the smartest guys in that topic. What we know is that it's actually better to vary the types of fish oil. There's an axiom you should respect, is that the more you're dealing with inflammation, the higher the EPA ratio to DHA should be. So a lot of brands will sell you a six to one ratio. And that will bring down the inflammation better than the three to one ratio, actually. If you're concerned with brain, so let's say if you have ADD, ADHD, borderline personality, uh, all the studies on brain disorders show that a high DHA, omega-3 product is better. So usually you want an eight DHA to EPA to one EPA ratio. But there's no magical fish oil. And the other thing we know a lot from research, it's better to take products like uh, uh, omega-3 avail from Designs for Health, who has also mixed in uh, D1, uh, D3, sorry, K1 and K2 into the product because those actually increase absorption. You don't need as much large quantity. And of course, your supplement is in important fat soluble vitamins. The next question is from Roddy Lee. And he asked me, you're not a big fan of uh, foam rolling. Isn't foam rolling a massage? The thing, my beef against foam rolling is that it would be trying to uh, build a bridge one pebble at a time. It takes far too long. So there's such a thing as the principle of training economy. I mean, Tim is big on that, whether you eat a four-hour body or any of his books. It's like you have to have maximum return least amount of time. So people waste a tremendous amount of time foam rolling. The amount of time they waste on foam rolling could be trying to get uh, flexible, could be done in a good 20 minute uh, active release session or rolfing technique or the voila method. There's a lot of stuff out there that exists to uh, get rid of adhesions and improve range of motion. So, and let's say if you have a good active release practitioner and you're foam rolling because you have a tight shoulder, if the guy does a good job, and let's say you're the worst case scenario, you have about as flexible as a crowbar. Within five treatments, you'll have 100% range of motion. And if you're a complete certified idiot, you will still maintain those gains for six weeks. So that's uh, six months, I'm sorry. So in my opinion, to go see a, a very good soft tissue practitioner and invest the, the time and money into that will save you all these countless hours of foam rolling because it will, you will have the results and it'll be more permanent if you see a soft tissue therapist. Next question comes from Clay Stenman asking me, do you have a lifting plan for body transformation? Even if it's a sale, I'm sure a lot of people would like to buy it. Well, like I said, I've done a mass program and the thing with the mass program is that people get so obsessed with fat loss that they should actually be focusing on mass and strength because if you increase your muscle mass, you become more insulin sensitive. Therefore, fat loss is accelerated. So when people come in, and if you look at the research, 
one of the fastest ways to lose fat is actually bodybuilding programs. I mean, they did a study on Puerto Rican obese teenagers, and one group did one hour of cardio, one group did one hour of weight training, and the mid group did half weight training, half cardio. And it turns out that the group that did cardio got fatter, and the group that did lifted weights for an hour got not only leaner, but also gained some muscle mass. And the group who did the intermediate program had a mixture of the two extreme groups. So in my opinion, for body composition, actually focusing on increasing your muscle mass works far better than trying to focus on fat loss. The next question is from Lior Parry. He says, considering the magnitude of the only supplement industry, how do we know which supplements are more effective or at all? How do we know if they even work? Well, you could go on PubMed and Google a supplement and then you'll find the research that backs it up or tells you it doesn't work. A lot of times, supplement companies make what I call extended claims. Uh, there's a good website called ergolog.com. There's subversity.com. There's examine.com. And those websites will tell you the real deal. Of course, there's a strong commercial bias. Do supplements work? Yes. They have, but one of the major things that dictates the quality of supplements is how they're made. So if you buy a supplement in Canada, which has very strong regulatory laws on supplement making, you'll get a good product because it, it's uh, the trouble you can get in if you produce a crap supplement is far too extensive. And the government does all the testing for you before you get approved over there. So that's why one of the reasons why I use ATP Labs it's made in Canada, and because it's made in Canada, I know the quality is very high. So, for example, Norway is very strong on protecting their own supplement industry, but because of the high quality of Kenyan supplements, you can actually ship Kenyan supplement, Kenyan made supplements into Norway, and they pass customs. Uh, but it's not true for supplements uh, all over the world. The UK is probably the country where they make the worst supplements. Uh, they do have strong legislation, but it's never been applied. And they estimate that if the UK were to put that law into action, 80% of supplement companies in the UK would be closing their doors. So depending on where you live, you may have access to high quality supplements or not. If you're going to buy supplements, I strongly recommend you buy them from a health practitioner because health practitioner brands are far more severe self-imposed restriction on quality control. I wouldn't trust most of the stuff you see on the internet because of that. Next question comes from Gabe, Gabe Rivera. This is one squatting, high bar or low bar, heel, lifting shoes or flats, train with, with or without a belt. A lot of needs to drift forward or has to drift back. These topics are not agreed upon inversely. Please explain why. The goal being maximal strength and hypertrophy. Well, Gabe, this is the reality. All the forms of squats you talked about, are good. The only thing I'm not big on is squatting with a belt. I think you, you should allow your your core to develop at the same rate as you develop your hip and knee extensors. Because let's say if you like to do slalom skiing, if you always train with a belt and you ski without a belt, your core muscles are not matching your leg strength, so you could get into trouble. If you're a wrestler, you're not going to be allowed to wear that belt when you go to the mat. So the trunk muscles should evolve at the same rate as um, as a hip and knee extensors. On my website, I've got plenty of different ways you could squat. I've actually filmed uh, over 188 forms of good squats. So there's a lot of, to choose from. And that, going back to what I said earlier on about Ed Cohn, he also thinks that you should have various squats more often to stay injury-free like Matt Venning. The next question is from Sam Sinclair. He says, Charles, a heavy set, set guy, 240 pounds, trying to reduce fat, loves lifting but training five days a week, can't shift it. Mostly paleo, okay, post 8 p.m., wine and crap food is a battle. I don't expect miracles, but one tip from a master. Namaste. Well, Sam, let me break it to you. All lean you are comes from the choices you make. So if you're 80% good and 20% terrible, well, don't expect to have 100% results. What I would suggest you do, if there's one tip I could give you, is only take on one habit per week. So for example, chewing. Lean people chew their foods 45 times, fat people chew their foods 15 times. So 
you could get one of those counters that bouncers use to control how many people that went to the bar and just do this. Start on this Saturday because you won't have any excuses. Chew your food and every time you take a chew, click uh, the clicker and see what happens. And you, you will find that you rush to swallow your full. The, so the low cost tip for fat loss is actually chewing your food. And even if you're trying to gain muscle mass, it's true too. Most people inhale their foods. Another thing you have to pay attention to, so it's a bonus tip, is do you actually eat in front of the screen? Are you on Facebook while you eat? Are you answering emails? So mindful eating is another way to lose fat. And then most people who are not doing mindful eating and sit in front of the screen consume far too many calories. There's a very good study from France where they looked at uh, female college students the first year and their dietary intake versus eating mindfully or versus eating in front of, let's say, something like Facebook. And the people who were watching screens while eating, on average gained seven kilos in the first semester of school. So paint at, you know, and you know, most people eat alone. So eating in company of, of other people helps uh, being mindful what you're eating and not rushing to your meal is probably the best tip I can give you on that. The next question comes from Dean Laster. How does he fit workouts to fit individuals with different needs, body types, stages in life? How uh, does he encourage positive building habits to accelerate one's progression? What are three to five best practices he recommends for someone to adopt to for staying fit for life? Well, that's a lot of questions, Dean, but let me answer them one at a time. I adapt training programs based on goals first. So what do you want? And based on what you want, I give you an estimate on how fast you can do it. So, you know, people would will show up and say, I want to lose 55 pounds by when in two weeks for my nephew's Bart Smithva. Hey, I don't have holes in my hands and my feet. I can't do miracles. So I always put that back into a reality. I want to bench press 400. How much can you bench press? 95 pounds. Well, let's take the next seven years to get there. So to increase strength, for example, if you are gifted within seven years, you could triple your strength. If you're not gifted, you can multiply your strength by 500%. Very few people do that because they don't know how to train. But if you go see a, a great lifting coach, like let's say John Bros, he'll triple your strength in seven years because now he knows how to do it. And I can tell you right now, he doesn't use peer-reviewed scientific papers to decide how to train. So there's such a thing as experience versus reading the research. Um, once I know your goals, then I make everybody do the Braverman test, which is a way to see which neurotransmitters you are gifted at producing and which one you're not at. And based on your neurotransmitter makeup, I will make you, you train heavy, a lot of variation, no variation. And I teach that in my advanced program the design classes. It takes three days to learn this. But neurotransmitter profile is key into deciding what you need to do. How do I encourage building positive habits? Well, the most important thing is that you have to look at progression, not perfection. So wh what do you do for an habit? One, well, you know, if you have an appointment with a dentist and you know you're going to be charged if you don't show up, you don't give 24 hours notice, you, you don't miss your dentist appointment. But people are not treating their body properly. So the most important habit is to actually have regular training hours. According to some research in Slovakia, some better people do better doing early morning workouts or evening workouts because depending on the time, they make the androgens throughout the day. So uh, a good clinical setting, I mean, tip I could give you is your sex drive. If you wake up under a TP every morning, you need to take a handstand, take a piss, you probably make your your androgens very early so you should train in the morning some people are have a greater sex drive in the afternoon then they should train in the afternoon so optimizing that makes a difference also recording everything you do tim ferris talks about his two weeks experiments and all that stuff that's great to do because if you don't live consciously you don't know what really works and then 
by having accurate journals of what you do, you'll be able to figure out what's best for you. The next question is from Peter Lam or Lama. Uh, is there a way to combine strength training and long cardio sessions? I've got two goals for three months. Run a half a marathon in less than two hours and increase my bench press from 70 kilos, three sets of eight, to 90 kilos, three sets of eight. I weigh 90 kilos and I'm 46. Well, Peter, there's an Hungarian proverb. If you only got one ass, you can't sit on two horses. To go for three sets of eight to 70 kilos up to 90 kilos is a um, realistic goal. But if you do train for a half marathon at the same time, it's going to take three to four times the time it takes. So what I suggest, you pick one goal and work on it. And then once you've accomplished that goal, move on to the next goal. It's like in the movie, The Last Samurai, Too Many Minds. You really have to concentrate on one goal at a time. There's a famous Norwegian weightlifter who's an exercise physiology professor who was top ranked at the Olympic Games in weightlifting. And he trained for the marathon for a year and then clean and jerk a pretty decent weight. But he could do the pretty decent weight because what people don't understand is that, yes, larger muscles lift heavier weights, but the main reason why you're strong on a pound for pound basis is actually that you develop the ability to recruit high threshold motor units. So the, the key lesson from that, build your strength first and then work on your endurance. Next question, Jeff Garza. There's a contingency of people online who claim your opinions and protocols lack scientific basis. How do you respond to these people? Thanks. All right, clinicians are always ahead of the curve. So for example, in February 2008, in the Journal of Applied Sports Science Research, they published a paper, Cluster Training, a Novel Approach to Develop Maximal Strength. So remember the date, February 2008. I first did cluster training when I was 14 years old. I learned it from my coach who learned it in 1968. When the article was published, I tried to go back and find where it came from, and apparently, it was used in 1948. There's some records of it, uh, of guys who prepared for the 48 World Championships who were using cluster training. So if you look at it, you have 60 years between guys figuring out it's a great training method versus uh, 2008. How many Olympics is that? If you only count Summer Olympics, you divide by four, that's 15 Olympics. If you add the Winter Games, you multiply by two, we're up to 30 Olympics. I've had plenty of my Olympians that when I start to coach for the uh, Moscow Olympics, who've been doing cluster training. So if I waited for the research, so from 1980 to 2008, uh, we're looking at uh, 28 years. 28 years divided by seven is four times two, right? So we are, I would have wasted 14 Olympic games waiting for research to happen. You look at, for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger's training, I'm pretty sure that he didn't use peer-reviewed studies to develop his physique. One of the things he's credited with is point of flexion training. So he figured out that if you overload different points in the biomechanical curve, you create more hypertrophy. Now research can demonstrate that it's great. Uh, one of the things I've been advocating since 1982 was to lower weight slowly to create more strength in hypertrophy. And I was recommending often to do five seconds lowering. The first study to be published to confirm that was published in 2016 by Pereira and his colleagues. Again, I would have wasted so many Olympic cycles not doing it. I've been advocating to change positions to in leg curls since I started strength coaching in 78. And the paper that shows that uh, turning your foot outward recruits more to bicep femoris. And if you turn your foot inward, you recruit more to medial hamstrings was published a few months ago. So again, those haters can say whatever you want, but the, there's such a thing called observation. And then you look at anybody that's any good, they will tell you also how not to train. He said, uh, what's the best way to train? Because uh, whether I talk to John Meadows or Dave Tate or Ed Cohn, they will say, I've tried this, didn't work. So, you know, these people are obsessed with results and they've tried many things to get there, and then they, uh, after a while, they figure out what works and what doesn't. So 
I don't really care what they say. And then the thing too is that a lot of people say, oh, there's no research on that. For example, leucine. I recommend much higher doses of leucine than my colleagues. And then I've been attacked. There's no papers in it. Yes, there's papers, but they're in French. And actually those two French papers use real training programs. A lot of these studies on supplements, the program that the subjects do is not even a workout. It's more like a warm up. But the two French studies I like on using leucine at people do 20 sets per body part and measure different uh, dosage of leucine and the highest dose at the greatest results and they tested up at uh, 30 grams. So the point is, there often there is research when they claim there's no research, you just don't know how to look for it. For example, Shishandra has 88 synonyms. So if you just Google, go on PubMed and search under Shishandra, you'll find X amount of studies. But if you go through every synonym, you'll find more studies. Holy basil has hundreds of synonyms. And you could search for holy basil and research, but if you look under Tulsi, uh, the Sanskrit name, you'll find countless numbers of papers. So those people who make those claims that I'm not scientific, they only have one thing in common. They've never produced results. And haters will always hate. And I guess it's frustrating to them that I've got great results and they don't have any so you, you pick on that but all the training i do is based on science and this, this is a thing also as common sense i don't need a study with double blind at a full speed front kick with a pair of construction boots with steel toes will damage your testicles if you want to be part of the possibly placebo group go ahead but you know there's such a thing as common sense so that's why you never meet, see me engage in um, disputes with those guys because one of, the things, one of the things my father taught me is you have to play fair and those guys are nitwits so I don't engage in debate with them. The next question comes from Preston Parrish. I once heard him say, if you're in strength training and can't get a female client to do 12 pull-ups in 12 weeks, then you're not very good and you should quit. Training plans to get women to do 12 pull-ups. Best exercise to help with 12 pull-ups. Very simple answer, Preston. Just go on YouTube and search under chin-up performance. I give you numerous tips on how to improve uh, chin-up performance. A lot of the re reasons why people can't do chin-ups is they don't know what to recruit. Uh, in my upcoming membership site, I will actually give actual programs to do that. And I have to demonstrate the exercise. So the podcast is not the best way to learn that but the information will be available on my membership site. The next question is from Morgan Brown. If you only had to pick one important factor between sleep, food, and exercise, which would you pick and or how would you prioritize them? Well, Morgan, that's like asking me, for optimal health, should I prioritize my liver or my heart or my brain or my adrenals or my kidney? <laughs> All of those are important. If you don't have a brain, well, forget. If you don't have a heart, forget if you don't have a liver you're not gonna live very long so you can't prioritize so much let's say if we look at prisoners at club fed they can sleep as much as they want is this sleep restful probably not because maybe your roommate wants to kill you the food food is prison food so it's not the greatest but they do have plenty of opportunity to exercise and they have weight rooms so in that case you could argue people can get a good physique and if you look at the book of Jail of Strong by Josh Bryant, some pretty good physiques were built behind bars. But then again, you say to the guys, we'll make you safe and then we'll give you paleo foods. Well, these guys will grow a lot. I'm not sure taxpayers would agree with that thing, but the, you can't prioritize them. You can't say, I'm just going to sleep to muscle growth or I'm just going to exercise to muscle growth or I'm just going to eat to muscle growth. You need all three. Next question is from Ryan Riley, cryotherapy seems to be an interesting topic because of the extreme nature. What are your thoughts on trying it just for the experience? Meaning I don't have any good reason to go, but it intrigues me. What benefits comes from it from the average person? A few years ago, actually in 2001, it was very fashionable for pro teams were sold on buying cryo suits. So the guy would train, put the cryo suit on, cost 150 grand, and they claimed it was good for recovery. So this strength coach from our rugby team said, hey, should I invest into that? I said, well, based on the quality of your weight room, 
I would take that 150 grand, buy yourself some real dumbbells and some real equipment. That is more important than a cryotherapy suit. And he says, why? You know, I said, well, first, first things come first. So if you get the choice between cryotherapy and a good weight room, get a good weight room. He said, okay, let's say if I've got a good weight room, would you buy the cryotherapy suit? I said, no, because unless you want to train yourself to be a, a Navy SEAL and withstand extreme temperatures, if you use cryotherapy post-exercise, it will increase cortisol and it will actually slow down your progress. He said, do you have any papers on that? I said, no. But I said, buy one and tell me how it worked. And then turns out that I would keep getting the same call. And all those cryotherapy suits that were bought in 2001, they're all in storage in sports clubs. They don't work. It slows down recovery. Some people argue that you could use cryotherapy short term to increase healing of tissue. Colleagues of mine have said, yeah, it's a good thing. Uh, because you get reactive hyperemia, so you increase blood flow to the uh, body parts. But to be fair, I don't have enough practical experience or I've read enough research on it to uh, validate its use. But I can tell you one thing, it does not increase recovery post-workout. It actually slows it down. Next question is from Andres Carso B. Yo -Yo. Top things you've learned in the last two years. In the last two years, I've reinforced the importance of measuring neurotransmitters for improving program selection. So some people are driven by variation. Some people do better with manipulating, manipulating uh, workloads. Uh, some people do better by keeping the program more constant, have less variation. So keeping that in mind, when I train people, I use that. I've been doing that since 2001 on a regular basis, but I'm more and more convinced because I've taught the system to students. The reason why I, I, I count as being uh, one of the most important things I've learned in the last two years is that many of my students, once I started to create that class, started doing that, and they were all 100% of them record, reported that they had much faster results when they, once they've applied the system. So that would be number one. Number two, it's more like how vital sleep is. I've always known it to be important, but in the last two years, there's more and more research. And if, for example, if someone wants to increase their testosterone naturally, the single most important factor is actually sleep. And we sleep far too less with also very poor quality because people read them on uh, messages before bed and look at screens. So avoiding screen time is very important for sleep quality. And then the next question is that, what does he know that the, it's not well known amongst the scientific world? It goes back to point one. I know well how to use neurotransmitters to maximize training response. However, in the mass book I wrote, I used a 70% rule. So, you know, I've, from the last 38 years, I've made it so that it will maximize training progress regardless of your, because I, I'm not psychic and I'm not going to write you an individualized program. So people wanted a program that would work for most of the population. And it, that's what I did. But a lot of it has to do with what's the optimal amount. If I don't know who you are, what's the best variation? What's the best I could do for the last 38 years? Jonathan Hyde asks, for someone who's wanting to start coaching in the strength and conditioning world, would you recommend something other than CSCS? What search would open up the most doors? Again, it's has to do with who did you learn under. Go see a strength coach that is that's produced a lot of athletes consistently over the years. No cert will do that for you. And expect to work for free. Ben Prentice was telling me that people come to his office and say, I want to train pro athletes. But the guy has zero experience. So his classic answer is, don't we all? So you have to apprentice. And if there's involved, counting reps. If you went to work for me and you said, I'm very keen, I would first assess how much do you know. I would assume, I would expect you, sorry, to know your bicep biomechanics, you know, know your basic physiology. 
no of loading parameters. So that's the homework you need to do on yourself, by yourself, before you show up. And probably the first thing you would do is just count reps. And then I would teach you how to select load. Why is Ben Prentice the best strength coach in America? Because one of the things I taught him was application of strength program design. I only let him start writing programs after two years. You know, so it's like wax on, wax off. You, you got to do your basis, basics before uh, you, you want to be a uh, strength coach. And there's no cert that will do that for you. Devin Sprankel says, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting for trying to gain lean muscle? In my opinion, it's a waste of time. Some people claim fantastic gains from doing that, but I've never seen any evidence of that. If you look at the research, both brain and muscle performance are negatively affected by intermittent fasting. So I'm not keen on that. There's not a single animal in the world that will voluntarily fast. And if you look at anybody big, really big, and really strong, one thing I have to tell you, they don't fast. And, you know, you don't grow muscle overnight. It's consistency of effort that matters. One of my earlier mentors was Bill Starr, and he will tell you, and I fully agree with him, but he told me that luckily I was 17 years old, was that the biggest thing to gain strength and size is consistency. And that is particularly true for eating food. And on the internet, people claim all sorts of things about intermittent fasting, but I've never seen any visual proof of that. And I've never met anybody who said, hey, I'm, I'm an intermittent fasting type of guy. And here are my results. So uh, in my opinion, it's a waste of time. Shane Quinnell, what is the most effective, efficient way to increase strength in a squat and deadlift when eating a plateau? My website is full of information on how to break those plateaus and that thing so you would have to go to strengthsensor.com but in a nutshell you have to vary your loading parameters but the biggest mistake I see in people leaving plateaus is because they've been doing one type of squat and one type of deadlift since Jimmy Carter was president. Variation of overload in the strength curve is probably the most neglected factor in overcoming a plateau. So you could overload the bottom of the strength curve by, let's say, pausing the squat, or you could use chains to match the strength curve, or you could use bands, you could do explosive work. It doesn't really matter, but probably the best program to improve your squat deadlift is a program you've never done. Uh, again, I will reinforce, don't be cheap. Open up your wallet and hire somebody who's good at improving your squat. Again, books will do something, reading on it, something, but... I would say, for example, your squat is terrible. Go to the Las Vegas, book an appointment with John Bros. He'll look at you. He'll say, okay, your squat is terrible because of this and that. And he'll write you a program. And the amount of time that you're going to waste on that trying to find a solution will be offset by investing money. If your deadlift sucks, find Ed Cohn, go see him. There's a lot of good coaches out there. Or your bench press is terrible. Go see Josh Bryant. He's, a, he's the expert at improving your bench press. But face-to-face -face consultation is the surefire way to uh, improve a lift. The next question is from Kieran Dong. What has he been a proponent of in the past that he no longer believes? Perhaps a scientific study updates. Actually, probably what I've, I've, I've changed over the years is that I used to use very short cycles, like two weeks. And then a colleague of mine convinced me to go to three-week cycles. And from experience, I may do only five-day cycles. So I realized that, you know, basically strength training is like learning a foreign language. So you need to change the stimulus. If you repeat the same words over and over again in the same order, you're not going to get strong. So a good example to give you is let's say if you're learning English and I show you in writing, did he, did he really say it? You have no idea because there's no intonation of the meaning of the um, sentence. But if I say, did he really say it, it implies is it him or not? Or did, did he really say it? You get the drift. So depending where I put the emphasis on the words, the meaning of the sentence is completely different. It's the same with strength training. As, you, as time went by, 
I realized that you need to put the emphasis on something different. And one of the things that I find works for everybody is much shorter training cycles. I don't like to go uh, more than two weeks or four workouts being repeated. The next question is from Jason Conan. What new insights did he gain training women's wrestlers, Helen Narulis and Elena Pioshkova for the Olympic Games in Rio? Well, thanks for the question, Jason. Two years ago, I announced on Facebook I was going to start working with wrestlers. And it was amazing the amount of hate posts I got, which would, would say something like, you don't know anything about wrestling. You know, what are you going to make them do? Train biceps. You know, haters are going to be haters. So I used that as a good motivation to show that I could train wrestlers. And Helen Merulis came in first, won Olympic gold, first American wrestler to do so uh, in history. And she beat a girl that only lost twice in 20 years or 16 years. Uh, but she hadn't lost a single fight in 12 years. And Helen, as you can see, the videos on YouTube mangled her. She overpowered her. And then when I was looking for the fight online, I kept getting text messages or WhatsApp messages from my students telling me congratulations. And they would have statements like in Sweden, all they talked about was how she dominated everybody with strength. So it's probably, it was the first, one of the best public display I've ever had about people could relate the effect of strength training on Ellen's win. And the Ellen did not do so bad. She came in fifth. And since then, I get asked every day to work with more wrestlers of different countries. But what did I learn? When I first started working for the two athletes, I asked the national team, what are your norms for strength training? And there was none. So I've done norms for strength training for sports all my life. So I said, okay, let's look at that. And again, I didn't have any double blind studies, but I figured out if you get strong at chin-ups, that should help you with takedowns, snapping the neck, uh, reversals, and so on. Because the lats and the elbow flexors are prime movers in those movements. So I've only trained for the world championships, Helen, for three times six weeks. And when she started with me in January, she could do zero chin-ups. And she did two supinated chin-ups with 27 kilos five days before she left for the world championships, which she won. For Rio, I trained her six weeks around Christmas, six weeks in the spring. So the total of strength training was about 12 weeks in preparation for Rio. And she managed to do two pull-ups on the rings with the 30 kilos the day before she flew out to Rio. And she won an Olympic goal, and every credits strength as being one of the major factors why she won. It's not the only factor. I mean, this woman doesn't have mindset. She has soul set. She's very driven, very smart. She learned Japanese so she could understand what the coach was telling her opponent between stops, right? So the, the thing is, is that what I learned is that there's some basic lifts that do transfer to wrestling. The most important ones are squats and deadlifts and chins. So if you drive those lifts up, providing everything's equal, you should have a transfer into the wrestling mat. Number two is that I was amazed at the misconceptions they're still surrounding wrestling. So people would laugh at her because she lifted weights. But once you won the world championships, and lifting weights very close to competition, uh, people will say, you shouldn't do that. You're going to be too heavy. You have to cut weight. But I've got a few tricks up my sleeve. I know we got strong and not put on any weight. And then for the world championships, if I started for the Olympic Games, she decided to keep training up to the competition, which in wrestling is avoided like the plague. But once she won the world championships, you would see on Instagram all her competitors taking videos of themselves training, but the methods they're using were horrendous. It was quite funny. I mean, it was a cure for depression to look at those DVDs and videos. And for example, when she beat the Swedish girl, you know, again in Sweden, they said, you know, she's far superior by strength. So the insights are one, squat, deadlift, and shins increments will improve transfer on the mat number two you need to, there's value in training close to the competition and number three 
<laughs> based on the response I'm getting, now people are valuing how much strength training can do for combative sports. Next question is from Ryan the Sink. What's his process in learning new languages? Again, I think it's exposure. So everywhere I go, I make it a uh, habit to learn at least how to say hello, goodbye, thank you, no problem. And I learn basic sentences because if you go to a restaurant, you know, they'll ask you, do you want bottle of water? Do you want tap water? Do you want the water with bubbles, no bubbles? Uh, would you like coffee? So if I go, let's say, to Slovakia, I'll go on being translator, write down these sentences. I have a local person teach me the co correct pronunciation. And let's say if I'm riding a cab, I'll look at ads and try to guess what they are. So I'll write them down, go back, go on being translate, write down what the ad said, and then pick it up. But the more languages you learn, the easier it is. And I was in Prague with the owners of Wolfgate and having dinner. And one of the tricks that helps me with learning languages, I pay attention when my friends are speaking and I try to slow down internally the conversation. And then, so now I say, okay, this word must mean this. So I remember the guy was ordering a drink. I said, that, that must be orange juice. And I was surprised I picked up because the word was not at all similar to what we have in our language. So, it's, learning languages is like strength training as well. I mean, it's repeated exposure. So I found that the Pimsler method is probably the best method to um, learn. Hiring somebody to teach you, and again, don't be cheap. Sometimes people do it for free. They'll do it as a trade. But in my field, how many times do I say, stick your chest out, put your elbows under the bar, Uh, lift your chin. So all these key sentences, I write them down, Bing translate them, verify with a local if it's, it. because sometimes Bing translate doesn't do a good job. That's rare, but they do a pretty good job most of the time. And I say, teach me those sentences. And because I keep repeating them throughout the workout, they sink in. But now I know the word, the verb strengthen, I know back, I know a bunch of words. And the, the, another thing I do is I try to read the menu and um, understand what it means. And, and I was in Montenegro last summer and they had sometimes the English and Serbian menu. So I learned quickly how to say chicken, beef and whatever. Then I went on the coast and had the choice between Russian and Serbian and Cyrillic. But I've taken Russian before, so I knew how to read Cyrillic. And then so I would read the Serbian menu and I knew how to order ribeye and all that stuff because I had uh, familiarized myself in the capital, but Gorica, with uh, the menu. And even my host was surprised how quickly I could pick up stuff. So it's just a matter of having an open mind and be keen. I mean, I like learning uh, foreign languages. I used to have many employees, and they wouldn't even bother to learn and say thank you and please. And I think that's quite rude. Uh, the least you could do is learn to say thank you and welcome. Uh, when you go to a foreign country. The next question is from Kyle Kulinan. What's your favorite book? I probably would say the one thing is my favorite book because it teaches you what to focus on and what's most important. A night changer for me was uh, the four-hour work week. I'm not doing that to kiss Tim's ass, but I think that the concepts in the book are very important to, to master. The next question is from Joshua Batali Bazi. What is... Charles Polycrine's one thing. The one thing is to finish my membership site. I've been working on it for the last three years. It took me far longer than what I thought. I've learned quite a bit during that process. It's not as simple as people think, but I'm very proud of being able to open it in January. The thing with the membership website is that there's a lot of confusion on the market. I can't teach seminars 365 days a year, so I kind of listening to my friend John Berardi, I decided to make guidelines of what I'm willing to do and what I'm not willing to do. I'm willing to educate a lot of people, but I can't travel so much. And then my information is valuable, so I created a membership site. And I've had quite a few colleagues look at it. And the interesting comment I've had is that I have too much information. So for example, we filmed 188 forms of squat. I was going to leave all the squats there. They told me, no, just show five new ones a month. 
because people get overwhelmed and they stop going. And my goal is to make it the, the best website for strength training and nutrition on the web. I'm very confident in doing so. And the people who have seen the content are blown away because there's things that I will teach in there through video that you can only get in my classes. I mean, it's really hard to write about these things. A lot of times it's demonstration is key in learning. Next question is from Chaz Christian Ancinelli. What is your crowning achievement? I'm not sure if you're asking me what is it that I'm most proud of. What I'm most proud of has not occurred yet. I do something. I don't think it's the end of the world. Like, you know, last summer I had two athletes win medals at the Olympic, one in triple jump, one in wrestling. That's great. But eight minutes later, I'm looking at my next goal. So I don't believe in crowning achievements. A crowning achievement is what people talk about when you're dead. I intend to be on this planet for far longer, so I don't have a crowning achievement. Everything I do is part of a pathway. Otherwise, your life is not worth living. So that is all. Thank you for listening. On my website, we'll have strengthsensei.com slash Tim Ferriss slash resources for the addresses where to buy some of the products or books I've mentioned. And for you, if you are interested in buying the Ultimate Mass Program, it will be strength sensei slash Tim Ferriss slash mass. And you'll be able to have access to it. Thank you for listening and best of luck in all your training endeavors. Thank you. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com all spelled out and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Trunk Club. There are two types of men out there. You know who you are. Guys who love shopping for clothes but are short on time, category A. And those of you who hate it, category B. I am in the latter category. My fashion sense is also probably somewhere between homeless and confused with a dash of lazy added in. Either way, you can take heart. And I've used Trunk Club now and have found some of my favorite pieces of clothing that make me look a lot better than I would be able to handle on my own. And there are many reasons for that. But you can get clothing that fits perfectly and looks amazing without ever stepping into a store again, thanks to Trunk Club and they make it very, very easy. And the clothing is handpicked by a personal stylist, your own personal stylist. All you have to do is go to trunkclub.com forward slash Tim, type in your measurements, share your likes and dislikes. They'll pick your clothes from more than 80 top brands and ship them right to your door. You keep what you like, you send back what you don't. If you don't like any of it, send it all back. It doesn't matter. And Trunk Club is not a subscription service. This is what appealed to me among many other things. I didn't want to constantly be getting dinged by things or have to deal with the headache of constantly getting boxes. It's not a subscription service. Shipping is always free and you have five days to try on the clothes. So, a uh, couple points here. Number one, get started today. Go to trunkclub.com forward slash Tim, try it out. You get premium clothes, expert advice, no work, no risk. That is a winning combo. And I have found some of my favorite espadrilles, shoes from them, bright green. Uh, I do like the color green and they actually work. I've had so many compliments on these shoes and more people ask me where I got them than any other pair of shoes I've ever had. And uh, more shirts, I kept ended up keeping about, I would say three quarters of my box, which I did not expect to do. So go to trunkclub.com forward slash Tim and check it out. Dozens, maybe even hundreds of you have asked me, what shirts are you wearing on YouTube videos? 
for a very specific set of shirts, and they are from Roan Apparel, R-H-O-N-E. And I'm packing for a trip for seven to 10 days, and I would say half of what I'm going to pack is from Roan. These are the most comfortable shirts, and they have much more than shirts, that I have ever worn, at least for active wear, for getting out and about. And you can even sneak them in to, say, a business casual or a dinner if you want, if you're a Long Island kid like me. They have minimal branding. You don't feel like you are walking around with some type of billboard on your chest. Anti-odor technology, because I am a smelly bastard, and I can somewhat end up smelling like a musk ox halfway through the day. They have pure melted down silver in their fabrics. And I love these shirts. I love their pants, I love their shorts. And I've been wearing them pretty much every day for the last few weeks, at least one item from them. So you should check it out. This stuff is not cheap because it is made from premium materials. And if you want the best, you gotta pay for the best and that's just the way it is. But there's no risk in trying them out. They provide free shipping and a 100-day return policy. That is plenty of time to feel them out. So check it out at roan.com forward slash Tim. That's R-H-O-N-E dot com forward slash Tim. You can get 15% off, which is exclusive for listeners of this podcast. You're welcome. Using the code Tim. You got to use the code, folks. And at that URL, roan.com forward slash Tim, you will also see the shirt that I would suggest maybe starting with. It is the Scout Crew Neck shirt. I like the red. I like the black. I'm wearing the red right now as I record this. And that is all for this sponsor announcement. So check it out, roan.com forward slash Tim. 